As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, all pharmaceutical medications prescribed by physicians are known to have side effects. Why do we give vegetable chemicals, plant defense chemicals like isothiocyanate, sulforaphane, et cetera, a pass and ignore the side effects of those medications, which are prominent and negative in humans, focusing only on the demonstrated positive benefits when we look with myopic research blinders. I don't know why we do that. <laughs> Again, it's not to say that plant compounds don't have positive effects in humans, but anytime you think a plant compound is all good, you're probably missing the negative side effects. And I wanna enumerate some of those side effects I wanna talk in detail about specific plant defense chemicals next to get a little more granular with this discussion, but do not ignore the side effects of these chemicals. On Rogan's podcast, Joe's often said that he thinks of broccoli similar to a sauna, that it's just getting you a hormetic benefit. And that was why I made the broccoli versus sauna video. Broccoli is different than a sauna, in my opinion. One of them is an environmental stressor that isn't a molecule that you put in your body. It's going to create oxidative stress, going to activate the NRF2 system, and going to create an increase in glutathione and other compounds, enzymatic systems in your body that manage oxidative stress, yes. Broccoli has compounds that do the same thing, but those broccoli compounds have other negative effects. I think that if you look at the literature, you can make a pretty strong case that broccoli doesn't add anything to your physiology. We do not know, and I think that there's evidence to the contrary, that broccoli does anything above and beyond what you can achieve in your own life. Through exercise, through sauna, through cold plunging, through fasting, through sunlight, these are environmental hormetics. And I think that most of us who are eating a good diet, just as it said in that paper with 600 grams of fruit and vegetables with no effect on oxidative stress, the endogenous antioxidant mechanisms for most of us are adequate. They're all we can get. They're the best we can do. Adding vegetables doesn't give you any more than that, is my belief, and then you get all of the attendant side effects. In the case of broccoli, you get isothiocyanates, which can be harmful to the thyroid. These side effects are being ignored. So that's a really important point that often gets overlooked in these discussions of plant defense chemicals, but it's something that I've been doing my best to communicate as clearly as possible for quite some time now. While we are on the topic of broccoli, this paper I think is quite striking. Concentrations of thiocyanate and goitrin in human plasma and their precursor concentrations in brassica vegetables and associated potential risk for hypothyroidism. It's a long title. The takeaway is that in certain brassica foods, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale, there is sufficient amounts of an isothiocyanate called goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake by the thyroid. So often we hear about sulforaphane, but the most goitrogenic substance in these foods appears to be a compound called goitrin. Goiter is the enlargement of the thyroid gland that happens when we become hypothyroid due to inadequate amounts of iodine in the human diet or these compounds and plants robbing us of the ability to absorb these things. But this paper is suggesting that in amounts commonly consumed by humans, there is sufficient amount of goitrin to significantly affect the iodine uptake at the level of the thyroid. Why would you eat something with that potential if you're not getting any net benefit, if you're not getting any benefit that you can't get by living your life in other ways? This is my argument about vegetables and about plant defense chemicals. Again, I think they're harmful for humans, and I think that consistently we can see they are a net negative. What are some other types of plant defense chemicals? Well, let's talk about oxalates. Oxalates are dicarboxylic acids, often found in seeds and beans, and we know that oxalates can accumulate in the human tissue and cause problems. There is a very striking case report that has been often discussed of green smoothie cleanse causing acute oxalate nephropathy in a patient. Now, it's important to note this patient did have predisposing factors, including a remote history of a gastric bypass and recent prolonged antibiotic therapy, which may have increased her absorption of oxalates, but she was doing a green smoothie cleanse, developed end-stage renal disease from the oxalates, leading to long-term dialysis. Now, this is not gonna happen to everyone who does a green smoothie cleanse. It's just to say that oxalates are real. They are present in large amounts in things like spinach, and kale, and turmeric, and rhubarb, and they can be problematic for many people. There's a very interesting case series of autopsy that I'll show you in one moment, showing that oxalic acid oxalates are found on autopsy in many individuals in places where there's no biological role. In fact, oxalic acid oxalates are generally a waste byproduct that is excreted in the human urine 
There is a small amount of oxalate produced per day in the human body from breakdown of certain amino acids, but we can massively increase our intake of oxalates when we eat foods like this. This is actually a graphic from the carnivore code. You can see turmeric powder per 100 grams is super high in oxalates. Well, let's put some turmeric powder in a smoothie with some spinach. That's probably the most problematic thing for people, which is why it should always be avoided if you have oxalic acid kidney stones. My dad had an issue with that. Uh, sorrel is another plant leaf that is commonly consumed in wilderness adventurers, but not by the rest of us, almonds. You might add some almond milk to your smoothie and you have turmeric powder, spinach, almond milk, and maybe let's put in some uh, cocoa powder for good measure. And you have an oxalate bomb <laughs> right there. This is what oxalates can look like when they form raphide crystals, these needles. Sometimes they look like this. Sometimes they have other forms in the human body. This is just to say that oxalates are real. They occur in plants. There is no known benefit of consuming them in your diet. And in fact, they probably inhibit the absorption of other minerals and nutrients in your diet. So this is the autopsy study, calcium oxalate crystals in the thyroid. It says they're not encountered in normal animal tissues, except for the human thyroid, where they were found in 79 of 100 routine consecutive autopsies. They appear during childhood. The numbers of the crystals increase with age and diffuse hyperplasia prevalence of higher Prevalence was higher, but crystals were fewer than expected. Now, it's interesting that the authors believe this is normal for oxalate crystals to occur in the human thyroid. There's no physiologic reason for oxalate to be in the human thyroid that we know of. And I think this is probably just an accumulation of oxalates in the thyroid because we consume them commonly in childhood leading to adulthood and they increase with age. So I don't know that it's necessarily normal for oxalates to be in the thyroid. Interestingly, they do note in this paper that people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis had less of the oxalate crystals, possibly due to an autoimmune reaction, clearing the thyroid crystals out. Perhaps there's some connection between oxalate crystals in the thyroid and Hashimoto's. We don't fully know, but there's no reason for oxalate crystals to be in the human thyroid. And I think this is a clear indication that they do accumulate in humans. In animal models, oxalates are also known to induce breast cancer and accumulate in breast tissue. So you can see here, we found that chronic exposure of breast epithelial cells to oxalate promotes the transformation of breast cells from normal to tumor cells, inducing the expression of a proto-oncogene as CFOS and proliferation as breast cancer cells. Furthermore, oxalate has a carcinogenic effect when injected into the mammary fat pad in mice, generating highly malignant and undifferentiated tumors with the characteristics of fibrosarcomas of the breast. And this is something that we are told is not a big deal for humans. Do we really feel safe saying that? You should eat a spinach salad every day. This is what I used to do when I was younger. I would just eat spinach straight out of the bag. I thought it was good for me. Why are we eating spinach? I just, I cringe whenever I see anybody at the grocery store eating spinach now thinking there's much better ways to get all the nutrients that you think are so valuable in that spinach, animal foods, liver, organs, without all those oxalates. So just one piece of the puzzle here with regard to the plant defense chemicals. More broadly speaking, polyphenolic compounds from plants, many of which are plant defense chemicals, are known to inhibit digestive enzymes. This is the intention of plants with these defense chemicals. This is how plants do animal and plant warfare. Plants don't wanna get eaten. They are discouraging you from eating them. They are inhibiting your absorption of nutrients so that you will not thrive as much and you will avoid that plant the next time you come back to it. This paper is talking about the inhibition of digestive enzymes by polyphenolic compounds. They say the ability of polyphenolic compounds to form insoluble complexes with other macromolecules, such as proteins, has long been associated with the observed reduction in nutritive value resulting from their inclusion in animal diets. Okay, it is concluded that the observed reduction in protein availability found in vivo on consuming high tannin diets, plant tannins, plant defense chemicals, cannot simply be explained by the formation of dietary protein tannin complexes, and that the ability of polyphenolic compounds to inhibit digestive enzymes may be of greater significance than realized previously. So this is an interesting point. Often I hear anecdotally that people will say they have trouble digesting meat, and I ask people what they are eating it with, and if they are eating the meat with vegetables. Is it possible that you are eating vegetables with tannins, and that is inhibiting your digestive enzymes and preventing you from digesting other foods you're eating at the same time? Yes, it is. This is the deep, dark, interesting rabbit hole of plant defense chemicals that very few are willing to look at, but there's a good amount of data to suggest that these are actually negatively affecting human health.